I'd like to introduce you now to Daniel Doherty. Some of you may, well, may know Daniel very well um, through his work at um, Sacred Art of Geometry Studios. Um, among many other things, he um, teaches the philosophy and practice of labyrinths. Uh, he was a student of Keith Critchlow and is a great delight to listen to. Um, I'm sure you'll be fascinated by his talk on the beneficial effects of working with the power of labyrinths. And this evening, Daniel will be creating a labyrinth with Mandy Pullen and Jane Embleton, um, so that we can put into practice what we learn from him in this session. So please welcome Daniel Doherty. Listening to um, Ellen this morning reminded me of a very beautiful um, and very real vision that started off the year and it's sort of an invocation to the year um, when my wife and I it was the first full moon 15th of January I might just have to shout no, it's, it's, no, okay. it's okay so 15th of January you may remember it, it was a beautiful full moon and um, we had just recently moved um, on to the Ashdown Forest and it was the first snowfall of the year, something I get very excited about, having spent 10 years in Australia. Um, it was one of the reasons I was very keen to move back to England. And the first snowfall, and the children were fast asleep, and my wife and I, we thought we'd better go and get the sledges. They're in storage down at the, the farm stables, you know, a mile or so walk away, and we set off 10, 11 at night. Full moon, it was as bright as a stormy summer's day. Beautiful evening with the, the full moon beaming off the snow. And we picked up the toboggans, walked back up the hill to the forest, and what did we see but a herd of deer around a white heart. So unbelievably compelling, and we felt so alive. And Vera and I, we were hitting the slopes, testing, making sure all the runners were fine in the middle of the night, pursuing this white heart. And somehow, it's a, I feel it's related to being here and present with you all um, today. Not quite sure how. Or, um. So, <coughs> measured steps. Thank you, Louise, for suggesting the title, Measured Steps. Um, it's certainly one I'm going to be working with, it's one I work with, but I do love the title Measured Steps. Um, and it's, I feel, incumbent upon me to remind us, some of us, we um, tremble to hear it because our, our trauma goes pretty deep from our geometry lessons from way back when. Um, but we are all geometers. We are all geometers, whether we like it or not. Um, that is, we measure the earth, geometry, with every step that we take. Compass, compasses, these very sacred tools um, mean, compass, it means to take a step, with step. So with every step we take, we're measuring the earth. I, I suppose that's what the gatekeepers is all about. It's, it's about um, becoming as conscious and as sensitive as we possibly can to those steps and to the measures that we use. Well, I do love this. Um, this is a detail of a, a wonderful, you probably recognize it as a, a William Blake, um, not a very well-known um, painting of his, but how profound. Uh, William Blake is a master at pointing out the, the potential pitfalls and the potential possibilities inherent in this practice of geometry. Um, so you see Christ in the carpenter's shop, and all is well so long as you have your eyes, your gaze fixed on the divine. Pattern, pattern after all, um, comes from pattern, father. It's a very, working with these patterns, um, we have a beautiful studio at Emerson College, um, and that's what I love to do, work with these patterns. Um, perhaps 
just before we go on, um, some very primary inherent symbolism in these tools. Normally, I am a little uncomfortable just talking about geometry and measured steps and labyrinths. Um, luckily, we will be participating um, this evening in the walking of one, but they, this is a study that needs to be practiced. It's one of the liberal arts, um, one of the freeing arts um, that Peter was referring to, liberal also in the sense of being able to liberate us from our mundane, everyday attachments and linking us, relinking us. It's a religious activity. Um, Primarily, like the candle flame there, it has that ontological axis. It connects us to the heavens, just as, as Blake is showing us um, it can do. Then, it's also creating at this stage, it's bringing that point, a very powerful point, which um, I know some of you in the room have heard me wax lyrical about this before, a point... Um, isn't something to be passed over. A point is the source of all of life. That point is totally beyond our comprehension. We puncture, we puncture the page with it when we work with our patterns. Um, we give it position, but don't quickly um, pass over it. And don't also contemplate it too deeply, because I guarantee it will blow your mind. Because it's beyond our rational comprehension. Um, but we place the point, we open up our compasses, we create that very expressive, it's symbolic on so many different levels. Ah, that generative, generative alpha. I am the alpha and the omega. You know, these are the tools that are the beginning and the end in, in, in a certain sense. So, getting a rather literal, literal here, measured steps. Do any of you recognise the staircase? Well, well, well worth a visit to Wells. Um, magical, magical place. And a dear friend and colleague, Tom, Tom Bree, who I'm sure many of you know, he is um, a very primary measurer, um, and he introduced me to these beautiful steps. I had actually experienced them before, but without the consciousness that he drew my attention to, um, we measured the steps, counted them, and found that they embody this beautiful lunar cycle, leading up to the, the Wells Chapter House, this octagonal chapter house, um, the little piece to the diagram, the top, sort of middle top, of um, the cathedral diagram. 29 and a half steps. Exactly the days between full moons. Now, this wee fellow, I had walked up and down the steps a few times, measuring and talking and discussing and um, being amazed, and I didn't notice. This chap, he is one of the dragon tamers who flanks the door, flanks the stairway. There's one on each side with his left hand, very, his wisdom hand, very um, gracefully keeping that dragon in check. And it was, I kid you not, he spoke to me. We, it was just after the conversation we were having at the top of the steps, everyone had left, I was lingering a moment. And all of a sudden, it was a dull grey day, and all of a sudden, a blast of light came in from the opposite window and illuminated this fellow. And he just started speaking and said, it's all very well, all your measuring, all your, um, you know, your chatting, but what's it for? Put it to good purpose. You know, let it be um, toward this task that I'm involved in. You know, upholding this this pillar, this heavenly pillar, um, and keeping the, the dragon 
um, keeping the energy flowing in ch though in check. Mm -hmm. It was a delightful interaction. Yeah, a couple couple of images. I think it's it is um, and William Blake again. He is so so good at reminding us just what you know the importance of our intention and our attitude in these sacred endeavours. They can be put to great and good service, good service, good will, um, or they can be used to, um, you know, to a lesser degree of benefit for society. Um, so, fairly self-explanatory. Um, a New Year's sunrise at my local beach back in Australia. Um, Baja Beach, New Year's sunrise. And there's a fellow there, I could see him in shadow, he was, I'm not having a dig necessarily, there might be some very keen hobbyist metal detectors in the room. Um, however, he didn't once look behind him at the rising sun. And I wanted to cry out, for heaven's sake, are you looking for gold, mate? Look behind you. You know? Um, and it was the lovers, those two lovers, they came in, I took a series of photos, um, because it was just too poignant, I thought this is going to make a good slide at some stage. Um, the lovers came into the picture, um, sort of mid-sequence, and um, sat down and watched the sun. As Peter was reminding us, surely it's love that turns the world. And one more of these real juxtapositions, um, the divine geometer, or William Blake once again, he who sees the, the infinite in all things indeed sees God, he who sees the ratio only, sees himself only. So, going back to the, cast your minds back to the, the first image. Um, we have to have our gaze fixed on the heavenly patterns. On these beautiful dance, you know, the dances of the planets. The constellations with the weaving wanderers. Planet means wanderer. So, to bring them together... This beautiful marriage of seven and, and twelve, that's embodied in sacred buildings and architecture all over the world. I'll show you some images in a bit, embodying those principles. Who drew, who did that one? They are, um, so William Blake on the left, and, um, and then it's from a 1440, 1450, a French medieval, um, a French illuminated manuscript. Um, it's only so big. I was in, I was in London some years ago, um, visiting from Australia, and I was on a bus going down the, you know, past the British Library, and I saw a massive big poster of that image, and so I leapt off the bus, and um, it was on exhibition. It was on display. It was only about that big, um, but very happy to see it. That big and exquisite. Can you see? I don't know the quality from where you are, but. That all the all the elements are made up of angels. All the all the you know the backgrounds are all angelic forms, angelic beings. Very beautiful, and those and that light body that Peter was so very beautifully speaking about, raying out. Turn it, pull your down a bit. Down a, a bit, bit more. Thank you. My pop That's fine. Is that okay? Great. Let me know at the back if um, I don't quite dare to touch that. Um, all right. Can I share you the very final stanza? Share with you the final lines of Dante's epic journey <clears throat> from his Divine Comedy. Um, it's really sorry. Um, it's what labyrinths are all about, as far as I'm concerned. It's what all the, all the work I do is about. Reconciling heaven and earth. Bringing matter and spirit into harmony, into union. You have on the right-hand side, just before, before um, we read this together, see a lovely piece of um, Japanese Zen calligraphy by Master Sengai. Um, one dip of the, the brush in the ink, and... He, having perhaps waited, well, a whole lifetime, 
you know, he left home as a young man, shaved his head, went to the hills, found himself a master, became a master. And so this is a summation of a lifetime of learning and wisdom. And, you know, in this tradition, if the inspiration doesn't take you, you might be waiting, looking at a blank page for days. So when it comes, with one dip of the ink, circle of heaven, triangle and square, more like a golden rectangle, which we'll come across again. The triangle of human consciousness, it's our task to reconcile heaven and earth. The task of the geometer, the task of all of us wanting to pass the gate, as the geometer his mind applies to square the circle, nor for all his wit finds the right formula, however he tries. So strove I with wonder how to fit the image to the sphere. So sought to see how it maintained the point of rest in it. Thither my own wings could not carry me, but that a flash my understanding clove. Whence its desire came to it suddenly. High fantasy lost power and here broke off, yet as a wheel moves smoothly, free from jars, my will and my desire were turned by love, the love that moves the sun and the other stars. Isn't it beautiful? I mean, we. We are so locked into this sort of cult of cleverness. James Hillman, had, he r rallied people. He said, make that 18-inch drop for heaven's sake. Get it from here down to here. Um, we, Michael Lunig, this wonderful Australian cartoonist, talks about the cult. We're sort of ensnared in this cult of cleverness. Rudolf Steiner, this lullaby of materialism. Um, oh, but see how far you're going to get if we rely on our wit? Nowhere. It's the first thing you have to let go of in this vital task. You have to begin with wonder. The seed is wonder. I have one, it's almost like a commentary on this Dante, this conclusion to the Divine Comedy. It's a, my favourite piece of, of um, writing by Rudolf Steiner, it's actually from a lecture, 1912. Wonderful. Let me read it to you. A man, maybe ever so clever a thinker, he may even suffer from a superabundance of intelligence. If he has never passed through the stage of wonder, nothing will come of it. And then he goes on. After the mood of wonder must follow the mood of veneration, of reverence. And then a third condition must take hold in the soul after we have experienced wonder and reverence. And this third mood we may describe as feeling oneself in wisdom-filled harmony with the laws of the world. That's really where these quadrivial studies come in. It's not even a feeling, it's a knowing that you are participating. You are in harmony with the, the laws, the wisdom-filled harmony um, and the laws of the world. And then Steiner says what comes is in a sense the very highest condition of soul to which man has to attain if he would arrive at truth. And this is the condition to which we may give the name devotion or self-surrender. And these, these, these are measured steps, aren't they? All sacred cultures, until, in fact, I suppose the last 300 years, when it all was thrown out, baby in bathwater and the whole lot, um, there was this acknowledgement that there were different levels of understanding. Um, and the level that we love to wallow in these days is the very literal, the very, it's the first level, the lowest level, the, the literal, the historic level. And you've got to remember, that, you know, finally, the final level is one of becoming this total at one -ment, attunement. Um, Steiner goes on to say that even then, you know, it's this process of we are but vessels, receptacles, and then we can but, you know, ripen ourselves, warm the wick, so to speak, so that the flame can 
jump to us more readily, but then it's just still a process of allowing things to be open to the idea of things jumping to us. Which, because we're here, I'm, I'm sure we're all aware of. So, Keith Critchlow, my dear mentor and teacher, um, a little introduction from that wonderful John Michel book on sacred geometry that hopefully you all have on your bookshelf, if not, order it for Christmas. It's a wonderful book. Um, and a lovely dedication to, to Keith Critchlow at the front. He is our living Pythagoras, real inspirer of teachers and teachers of teachers. Um, but it was just working with the theme, pathways of light, working with the consciousness of nature. I, I asked myself, why? You know, why do I love Socrates and Plato and Blake, and why do I work with these tools, these compasses? And you know, well, in part, it's because of my devotion to my teacher, my love of, of his work, and indeed his love of his teachers. And there's this, there's this. In a way, it's tradition, one of these many dirty words these days, just old tradition, but in the truest sense, tradition is this passing on through love. Um, he certainly, Keith, really introduced me to this door, you know, told me to knock hard, knock softly, put your ear to it, have a look under the cracks. If you're lucky enough, you know, and you're, you're not afraid of now Plato's cat, peep through the hole. None unversed in geometry shall enter here. That's uh, the inscription on the famous Platonic Academy. What on earth does that mean to us nowadays? Uh, Keith has spent a better part of a lifetime exploring what it means. Um, Could you repeat that? None, <coughs> none ignorant of geometry or none unversed in geometry shall enter here. I, for me, in a way, it's equivalent to, so um, to Socrates' injunction to, um, well, an unexamined life is a life not worth living. We, remember, I said, and we all know it, we're geometers. You know, it's about becoming conscious of the steps we take, essentially. But I do want to go off on a little tangent, um, a very important one, given the theme of the conference, relating to Naus. Plato's cat, <laughs> because <laughs> barely a year or so before returning to England, making our base back in England, um, we had some friends who, who lived, neighbours of ours in, in, Swiss, in, in Australia who were moving to Switzerland because they had a, um, a sickness in the family. Someone, a family member was close to death. They had, a year or so before, befriended this very feral cat, really wild fellow. Um, Shusha, she actually, and um, their two little children, they were wild little rambunctious kids, but this cat was gentle as anything with their two kids, and um, they tried to shoo it away, shoo it away, kept coming back, kept coming back, and so eventually they adopted it and took it on, and when they, when it, they had to return to Europe, no, they couldn't find a home for it locally, so my wife had the task of taking it up to her mother's, maybe she was 50 kilometers away in the countryside, and um, she has still got the scars to prove um, that this cat had a wild streak still, as, um, as she popped it in a box and in the back of the car and drove it up. So, these two maps, very, in fact, the top of that map um, shows you where my mother-in-law lives, and down, there I move, um, you know, down here somewhere, just mid Newcastle, um, that's where this cat, after about two weeks, disappeared from its new home, and a month later, it took that journey. I doubt it had sat nav and worked out the most appropriate route, so it had motorways, it had rivers to cross, it took it a month bag of bones, arrived on the doorstep of our friend's house. They happened to be in Switzerland, but it arrived on the eve of, of the death of the, 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 the father, the sick relative. How can you explain that? How on earth can you explain that? 
and my dear, very sensible friends and colleagues, um, you know, we tried together. One dear friend said, they do have an acute sense of smell. <laughs> but, you know, I doubt it took that most direct route, it could have, but that's 50 kilometres. Um, isn't that wonderful? It is a total mystery. But I can own, my only explanation was something to do with these pathways of light that Peter was you know, talking about. And the idea of a pilgrimage path becoming a pathway of light. I love that. And the fact that it turned this cat, shusha we call it, turned up um, on the eve of the passing of, of our friend's father, that was significant. That message was conveyed to them and it moved them to tears, as you can imagine. So that cat got its message across. It was put back in the box <laughs> and taken back home, and, and she's very happy. Um, I'm delighted to say she's not going to do it again. Um, so, measured steps. These pathways of light, every time I turn the compass, I feel like I'm drawing with light. It's the most fundamental thing. Um, if I had a big flip chart, I would demonstrate it to you. Perhaps you can just do it in your mind's eye. That mysterious point that has no dimension, we give it position, we set the boundary. It's the only real piece of consciousness we bring into this, these patterns, setting the radius, the step. And then the first revelation of the point is the circle. That's tangible. We can relate to a circle. It's a total miracle that they don't draw your attention to at school for some reason. That a circle perfectly divides its, its own circumference into six by its own radius. So this, the most funda fundamental step underlying, I would suggest, all form, all life, all phenomena, is this relationship relating to six. You can see these two vesicas. Um, they just, you don't have to think about it. You can leave your wit behind, you can wonder, and this happens. It's the basis of all labyrinths, the basis of all pattern. For the mathematicians in the room, it's like for me, it's become a mnemonic, having fairly recently started working very deeply with the Venus dance, a beautiful, you know, eight-year, 13 Venus-year rhythm of Venus. Um, it's like a mnemonic to her synodic cycle. Because very simply, just every now and again, I can't help it but spew up a few numbers. Um, so, six times pi to the power of four. Just crunch that into your calculators when you get home. <laughs> is a body there? You'll get the exact Venus synodic cycle, one of those beautiful loops, 584 days. Um, it's all embodied in that pattern. So, to the home of perhaps the most fundamental of all labyrinths, often acknowledged to be the most, yeah, the, the profoundest of labyrinths, the Chartres labyrinth. Um, I love how my children, we were there back in May, um, we just turned a corner and all of a sudden my eldest daughter hasn't realised yet what's in front of her. My little boy has put his croissant down and he is just wonder, absolute wonder. Um, I would like to just spend a few moments, a few minutes going into to some of the cosmology embodied here. In the labyrinth, but um, Keith Critchlow, this may or may not work, um, but there is a YouTube clip embedded in this photo, whatever that means. So I'm going to try and share it with you. It's Keith Critchlow revealing some remarkable researches relating to the Chartres labyrinth, to some of its key measures, the sacred steps, the, the measured steps of Chartres, um, are deeply profound. I'm sure some of you have seen this before. Um, do I need to shrink it? Ooh. We now have a rather beautiful rendering of the front elevation of the cathedral. And I'm going to show how the height of the west front here relates to 
the length of the body of the cathedral. Having laid the elevation down like this, we can now see the completion of the two spires, the sun spire and the moon spire. I thought if I slide this over, which I did, I found there was an exact coincidence here with the first step in the front door down the whole aisle of the cathedral, the whole length, and concluding here. Now that leaves a mystery as to what this elevation is, so we slide this one across and we find that the gold sphere on top of this spire hits exactly and covers the geometric center of the radiating points of the plan here. That means that this distance between here and here is 28 feet in difference. Now that 28 indicates that each of those feet is one night of, the, of a moon cycle, each moon cycle being 28 nights. And on the solar front, this is 365 feet from the beginning of the church, and therefore this is indicating that each individual foot represents one day in a solar year. One must remember that this is standing up and is being folded down. It's like the folding the cathedral into another dimension, a shorter dimension. Now what we noticed, what I noticed here, which is quite remarkable, is as you peel this back, you meet the labyrinth here, in the same way as your eye traveling up the elevation, that's the first part of the rose window you see. So the main and remarkable coincidence of, of a direct fold down is that the rose window falls exactly over the labyrinth and is the same size. Both are 40 feet in diameter. It, it can um, totally boil you backwards, so that was two and a half minutes or so of some of Keith's um, research. There have been others, um, John James is an amazing um, architect who went to Charge for a week or so and spent six years in the caravan park, <laughs> measuring, analysing, trying to discover who the creators were, who the masons were. Um, I love how all these experts, and truly they are, but how they all come up with slightly different stories. And that's, that's one of the, they come up with not only different stories, but also slightly different measures as well. And then, if you're, care, if you're not careful, you'll get caught on that lowest level and have to start having, you know, lots of discussions about it. But the most powerful symbols, they, they can accommodate that. They can accommodate so many different interpretations. Um, the, this is the entrance. On the right-hand side, you see the Royal West Portal entrance. And it is those seven liberal arts that Peter was telling us um, this morning were so vital and so significant. Um, the School of Chartres arose out of a deep love of Plato, the Platonic tradition, the Pythagorean Platonic tradition, um, which tells us that these studies, Socrates, I don't think they had... The, the Republic, they certainly had Plato's Timaeus dialogue in their cathedral library. Um, they may have had the Republic, I'm not sure, but in it, Socrates tells us that it's through the practicing the liberal arts, particularly the essential mathematical studies. Mathema simply means to study, by the way. Um, but the essential studies were arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy. In, in total simplicity, um, these studies, Socrates tells us, can repurify and rekindle an organ of perception that we don't even know exists, so dulled and dimmed by our ordinary everyday pursuits. It can be rekindled, and this organ is worth 10,000 fleshly eyes, for by it alone is truth known, something like that. Wow, that was one of the reasons um, when I came across that passage that was one of the reasons I took to turning my compasses. But it's also one of the most powerful symbols I've come across. You, we have, each of us has the potential to become virgin-like, so that the sun can be illumined within us. You know, through practicing these, these practices, we can enter the womb of, of Mary.
the womb of the world, according to Joseph Campbell, the womb of Mary in name, house of Mary. A very powerful teaching indeed. It's seven. Sevenfold. And seven, as you all know, is a big, big mystery. When do we see seven? We have more. These are two images from the middle of the 11th, 1100s. Um, they, this is what was underpinning the cathedral and the most remarkable labyrinths, this Christian platonic sort of revival of labyrinth. The labyrinth tradition was being inspired by this understanding, this understanding of philosophia, the Sophia nourishing. She has seven streams, these streams of light perhaps, these streams of love emanating from her heart, nourishing her handmaids. The one on the right, you see Plato and Aristotle, uh, Plato and Socrates, rather, quite literally understanding her or undersitting her. They. And it's rather lovely. It's a seven, you know, it's a sevenfold temple. It's an architectural plan. You can see the columns. It's in two dimensions. Keith Critchlow is a master at trying to get us to shift between dimensions. I know. You, this room, we've got a room full of people, excuse me, who are very good at that. It's vital though, isn't it? To shift between dimensions. You know, the, 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 the upward pointing facade glides down and resonates with the two-dimensional, the, this horizontal plane. Um, but, in fact, it's probably worth noting that a few miles away, we do have a a temple, sevenfold temple in a sense, don't we? Made out of stone, no less. Avebury, I was blown away when I, someone showed me this wonderful program that you can get on the internet. It's called a latitude marker program. And within 10 meters of accuracy, you can place a latitude marker anywhere you like on the top of Chartres, you know, bell tower in the middle of Avebury Stone Circle. And if you haven't done it, do it. It's exactly 360 divided by 7. That's the latitude of the centre of Avery Stone Circle. 51.428 degrees. Why? How? But still, it's not visible, is it? We don't see 7. And 7 is very much to do with this journey of the soul. It's to do with the journey of labyrinths. I'd suggest even the Chartres Labyrinth, which has its 11 circuits, um, is still very much symbolised by the number seven, the wanderers, the seven visible planets. Um, it's a number of Mary, the ancients called seven the Virgin. Um, you can't really see it, but um, in, the, in that top one, I wanted to show the C diagram a little bit more. Um, but never mind, just a thought when I was putting these slides together that came to me was, yeah, that these lovely labyrinths, the, the classic seven-coiled Cretan labyrinth, um, you have the path, you have Ariadne's thread being gilded in the bottom right. Above it, you have the walls. Um, the seed is what alchemically is often referred to as a talisman of Jupiter. It's a four-by-four four square. Jupiter's other name is Zeus um, in the Greek tradition, and it was Pallas Athena that leapt fully armed from the head of Zeus. These nice little links sometimes. This sevenfold Pallas Athena, again, her number is seven. Peter mentioned the goddess of, of wisdom, of, of arts, of harmony. Um, the most profound geometry in the heavens, the most profound coincidence in the heavens. How can we allow the modern sages of science to say that is blimmin' chance? <laughs> oh, impossible. But these these wonderful and powerful tools, they embody this cosmology. Um, I have to come and do a, a good three-day with us at Seog Studios, Emerson College, to really go into it a bit more fully. 
Um, I was delighted, though. This is a fairly recent interpretation that came to me, and I like it. It might keep John James, all the various other measures might not concur, but those so-called lunation cusps around the end, that's lovely. They are lunation cusps, except, you know, you have 114 of them. 360 divided by 114 gives you a very good approximation of pi. Um, if you, and then what you come up with, you times it by 19 and you get 60 spot on, just for the number crunches present. Um, but essentially, once you've walked the labyrinth and you've returned, you've been, you've experienced a Venus cycle, a Venus year, 200 and because we, we, we've taken away a couple of, um, of entrance of the, the lunation so-called spokes to go in. Um, and that's so it's sort of held by love. I think it's, it's a valid interpretation. You have a Venus cycle surrounding the labyrinth. And you have, the, obviously, the four quarters, just some very basic um, key symbolism here. The four, the quartering of our experience of the cosmos, solstices, equinoxes, directions. You have 28 key turns, and then you have 28 so uh, archetypal lunar cycle between sidereal and tropical, um, plus six quarter turns. Six quarters, you could add them together and pop them onto the 28, and you've got 29 and a half, so each turn, in a way, a full cycle of turns, you could nicely say there's something very lunar about that. Anyway, better move it along. And um, I suppose just because I was recently struck by one of these total, inv you know, the, the way we love to sap wisdom out of words that are actually very full of wisdom. Myth is a classic example. A myth It's just an untruth. Oh, it's just a myth. That's just your imagination. Um, a myth is a repository of wisdom, etymologically linked to the word to whisper, to murmur. It's so sacred, you don't blurt it out. You whisper it. If you, are you ready? Are you initiated enough? And now it's just an untruth. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Everything's relative. Until about a week ago, anyone, if I heard anyone say, it's all relative, I would want to biff them. And now I, I realized, can we say anything with any more certainty? Everything is relative. It means everything is in relationship. Everything is relational. I don't, if there's one thing I can stand here and say that is true, it's that. Everything is relational. Everything is in relationship. So every time someone says it now, I just embrace them. <laughs> I give them a big hug. Um, and so this is just, in a way, broadening the, the picture of the Chartres Labyrinth, its position, its home. This is the South Portal. Um, and it's said, legend has it, that the Templar Knights, in their heyday, when they were all real initiates, they would, certain occasions, they were allowed to ride their horses through this portal into the church. And their head height then would be at the very feet of Christ. As it is now, we're, you know, these levels are so significant, these measures. But they would ride in and check out what they would see. They would see Christ's sort of light body, so to speak, on the opposite side of the cathedral. Isn't that magnificent? So the rose in the north, the north rose of Chartres, sort of serves as the light body of Christ. Holding the book, obviously not yet written, um, because it's Christ holding it. Um, and that's the image of a Templar knight, who knows? The most, um, the, the icons that really resonate, for me at least, there's no blood and guts everywhere. It's just this total submission. The dragon is held in check and very happy to be held so. Um, that little, that very significant book is a little cue into a, the next couple of slides in that it embodies 
this relationship of Earth and Venus. And there's at least two people in this room, um, Mandy and Jane, who are going to share with us this evening this, this labyrinth. It's a new labyrinth. It's really only come to the fore. There's no historical evidence beyond the last 100 or so years of probably can't see it. I've, well, down here, you can have a look afterwards. I've stuck a poster up in the foyer. This incredible dance, it will be on the slide in a moment, that Venus and Earth make. I love how Mandy and Jane are working with that as a labyrinth because it's a very important diagram for our times. And essentially, it's made possible and manifested because Earth and Venus have a relationship that's equal to the dimensions of that holy book. They are in a golden ratio with each other. I just thought, good to note, you don't often see that, but even Christ there, that's a pretty powerful dragon. Yeah. It's a, I was quite surprised when I saw that tail going all the way up. Um, so there it is. It's a really... Oh, it's been, I've been dreaming this pattern recently. It's only in the last month or so that I've learned how to draw it freehand. Um, and I was with John Martineau and Hartmut Vorm, the two astronomers, geometers, who have really, more than anyone else, as far as I'm aware, brought it to the fore, brought it to our consciousness. And um, we were in London together at a sacred mathematics event, and they were just enthused, because neither of them had hand-drawn it before um, in this way. And it's a glorious method. You know, I have to book on to our next Venus workshop um, to learn how to do it. Um, but, once again, just, we're doing it all the time. We are it. You don't have to come and do one of our workshops. You can eat an apple, a beautiful three-dimensional representation of that pattern in your apple. It's, it's made possible um, through this sort of double pentagram. That's a, that's a proportioning of it. Um, these are proportions within us. It just so happens when I stuck it up on a wall in say studios, it happened to be, ne it wasn't deliberate, but it's nice that the Vitruvian man of Da Vinci was next to it, because it reminded me, you know, these key measures are within us. You know, the golden number squared, that's one, navel, bottom of our feet, 1.618, to the whole golden number squared. Um, these are numbers that nature in all its beautiful variety, is working with, striving for. That, I suppose, just to, to show you, John recently, we had the good fortune of um, his presence and a number of other wonderful people at Seog Studios to, to go deeply into these, these patterns. Um, do you see the pentagram? And within it, there's a pentagon which has another pentagram within that. That, says, that is a diagram of the body of Venus. John calls it the body. She um, dances in front of the sun, dances behind the sun in this beautiful rhythmical um, way that relates to our rhythms, that relates to that beautiful diet. So the Earth rhythm every eight years, every 13 Venus years, we get this beautiful five-fold dance happening. It's proportioned. Her distances, her apogee and perigee points, are simply proportioned according to two nested pentagons. How simple is that? To a degree that John Martineau was stupefied by. 99.99% accurate with his calculations. He's also finding these, these similar proportions, not just in our solar system, but with with um, TRAPPIST-1, these new um, systems being discovered, he's finding it's not unique to our locale, which is Daniel, exciting. Fun. Thank you, that's good. All right. Um, it's good to remind ourselves to, oh, yeah, to count. To count, it was Pythagoras who said, believe it or not, and most of us nowadays definitely don't believe it, but the right practice of mathematics leads to the experience of true happiness. And one right practice is to, to observe the patterns, to look for the unity within patterns. 
So, and it's, it's this very much this sort of hermetic practice, this tradition of, of layered correspondences. So you can look at a pine cone, you can realize that there's 5, 8, 13 going on, it's an embodiment of Venus. It connects to us. It And even when things get misty and foggy, and the path is unclear, um, have trust, have faith. Um, I'm not quite sure why I included it, except as a beautiful image. Um, it's a lovely image. I suppose it's a labyrinth, after all. It's, I've never walked it, but it's said to be the world's largest labyrinth. Glastonbury Tor. I've only taken that direct route. Um, I think my little boy, last time we were there, he took the labyrinth path. He vanished. Um, I went up very quickly with my eldest daughter, and my middle one just marched up by herself, and my wife and the youngest son had a bit of a rah, 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 and she said, well, you just walk up in your own pace, and we were up the top for about an hour, and he hadn't appeared, not an hour, we were up there for 20 minutes, it's like, what's going on? So she went back down, didn't see him anywhere, and then came back up, and we got a bit worried, and, um, and then just as we were starting to go down and call the police, um, he, his head popped up around the side, all fours, scrambling up. What are you doing? Um, and he said, I was following the rabbits. <laughs> <laughs> Good boy. Um, follow the rabbits. Especially if they were white. Um, so, coming towards the end, a couple more slides, I think. Just a reminder, labyrinths, sacred geometry, um, in a nutshell. The higher purpose of geometry is to participate, body, soul and spirit, in the objective universal laws that govern and cohere our universe. This activity can lead us directly to the centre of our own understanding, which unifies us with the whole. Um, is this something sort of funny going on? Um, <laughs> truth and beauty. Yeah, this is really, this is wonderful. This is Michael Looning, and I would like to end with, um, with a, just to reiterate what Ellen and Peter were saying this morning. Am I? Um, Think something else. Okay, so. Yeah, this is a thank you to the gatekeepers. I'm fairly, only recently I've come across um, this wonderful work. Um, creating these little pockets of truth and beauty. How vital, how important, how easy to... <laughs> how, um, maybe it might be something to do with my... I always, when I talk about geometry and labyrinths and, uh, <laughs> and stuff... Um, Tell you what, just for the yes. just for the last couple of words, I will project or actually whisper, and then you'll really listen hard. Because I've noticed a few. Um, no, no. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, a real delight. Um, if you had the stamina to wade through the Sydney Morning Herald, <clears throat> at least there would be a Michael Lunig at the end of it to ah oh, um, bring a little bit of hope. Um, I was in Australia back in May and I had the good fortune of meeting him and he was saying how he's got this new um, motto he carries around with him so just to um, by way of conclusion let me just quickly check find the centre of the labyrinth and by way of conclusion yeah so Michael Lunig said, I'm delighted when I miss a train, miss a bus these days. Because I just sit down and I say to myself, be still, go blank, do nothing. And I, it's exactly what Ellen was telling us to do. We have to, if we're going to connect with the fey folk, 
with the subtleties that are desperate to connect with us, then we have to do that. Let go. Develop that gift of inattention to the mundane and allow the supra-sensible to enter. Labyrinths have a very... They can be very helpful to this end. So thank you very much. And just in case any of you are twiddling your thumbs next beginning of May, do come and join us for an in-depth three-day labyrinth course. Um, someone just mentioned to me that there's, I'm leading a labyrinth course with Tom Bree next month um, at the Chalicewell um, in Glastonbury, but I have an understanding that the last place might have just gone for that, but there's always May time. <laughs>